All right, let's get started. <clears throat> uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining in on the Marine Institute Graduate Society seminar series. Uh, we meet every week on Wednesdays in person and online. And I apologize. I, I think I advertise this as in person and it was just miscommunication on my part. And uh, so he is presenting, but he is. Uh, he is doing it from Webex. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to start it off with uh, a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Inuit of Natasinum as their ancestors and, uh, and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. And for today, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Noel Cadigan. Dr. Cadigan is a quantitative fishery scientist here at the Marine Institute, where he studies statistical methods for fish stock assessments in general and in specific fisheries like American Place and Atlantic Cod. He received his PhD in statistics from the University of Waterloo in 99. Uh, so that means he's the person that is rolling his eyes at us marine biology and zoology majors when we submit a paper that's wildly inappropriate in the statistical methods section. And I'm just kidding, that never happens. Uh, Dr. Cadigan is the research chair for Ocean Choice International, where he provides stock assessment and sustainable harvest advice for Northwest Atlantic fisheries. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Cadigan. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Colin, and uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, you know, so there's the title of my talk, 36 slides, so I'm going to get uh, right into it. But first, uh, just a, uh, a, a little background about the Ocean Choice International Industrial Research Chair, right, I guess. You know, some of the people attending this talk won't be too familiar with that. So, so I'm the chair and uh, the purpose of the research chair program is to advance the current practice and state of the art fish stock assessment with a focus on the uh, basically grand bank fisheries and their sustainability objectives. And in and more particularly, we, we've been focused a lot on American place, yellowtail flounder, witch flounder, and red, redfish species. And, and also, I, I should have said uh, Atlantic cod, three and all cod is also uh, a, uh, like a focus. And in fact, uh, well, I'm not going to show it here, but uh, we have uh, a long list of kind of specific deliverables that we agreed to as part of the research chair program. And so we've been working very hard to come to achieve those deliverables. Uh, so the chair actually ends uh, uh, this coming March, March 2022. And uh, this was a picture uh, taken, I guess, in, in March or uh, around there in 2017 at the start of the chair uh, program. And it's just kind of a, a a bit amusing to me how many of these people are no longer involved in in in, in this. Like this guy's gone, this guy's gone, this guy's gone, this guy's gone. So it's the smaller, smaller crowd. There's been some turnover uh, in the five years. So uh, as part of the research chair program, we strive to have close collaboration with the FO on implementation of the stock assessment models. I mean that. That is, I think, how OCI will ultimately kind of judge the success of the research chair program if if there are uptake, if there's uptake uh, of the you know of what we develop uh, in uptake by DFO and other researchers to actually uh, so that things get used uh, in practice when providing harvest advice. And another objective is, of course, to train uh, students for fish stock assessment. Okay, so back to the talk in specific. Uh, so the outline, uh, I'm just going to uh, talk about integrated stock assessments. I mean, this is the the the, the title of the talk is recent recent uh, 
recent advances in future directions or whatever. <laughs> the recent and future about stock assessment. So, so I'm not going to be talking about how stock assessment used to be done. Uh, uh, so, the outline then is integrated stock assessments, statistical and state based models, which you know important parts of those things are getting what's called something called the likelihoods right, getting the data right. And I'll also talk about spatial stock assessment models. And, you know, some space is like the final frontier, I think. Well, eh, probably not the final frontier, but it is a definitely un largely unexplored frontier in the in stock assessment science. So, uh, but <laughs> I, I don't think we'll be always building like spaceship enterprises to as uh, stock assessment solutions. Some of our models may be uh, perhaps better characterized as, as uh, I don't know, many, many of you can, uh, maybe you can't remember the movie that involved this car, uh, 1968 movie, and then the car's name was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I had one, I had a toy Chitty Chitty Bang Bang as a kid that I thought was really cool. Uh, but it, you know, but the thing, chitty chitty bang bang. I mean, there was no uh, no Starship Enterprise by any stretch of the imagination. But it did get get from point A to point B uh, very reliably. So uh, uh, with not too much fuss. So I mean, it's okay. We don't have to make Starship Enterprises for every uh, for every spatial assessment model. Anyway, so I thought first to start off with a, a kind of a, a quick review about. What is the stock assessment anyway? What are the basic questions that uh, are addressed typically in a stock assessment? And there are four. So the first is like what is the current state of the stock relative to its past or reference values? And uh, closely associated with this is uh, 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 another question about what were the magnitude or magnitudes of human impacts? And usually we're talking about uh, fishing impacts. And this is, you know, the skills you need to address these questions are basically like accounting or actuarial skills and statistical skills. You don't really need to know much about fish biology or marine ecology to do this, you know, to address these things. But another question is uh, involves what should the stock state and harvest rates be? And that is essentially a marine ecology question. Uh, and finally, I guess what managers are really interested in are uh, what will be, so now we're talking about the future. Uh, well, the, 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 sec, the third and fourth bullets are, are kind of concerned with the future. So the fourth one is what will be the short and long-term stock risks of proposed management options. And the skill set you need to address that is basically, you know, statistics, marine ecology, you need good computing skills, you need to, you know, increasingly, I think, uh, need to have some, some training in stochastic process theory. Uh, and, uh, and it's that fourth bullet, I think, that is, you know, that is the important way or an important way for science to contribute to sustainable fisheries management. So managers really, you know, need specific guidance on, you know, what levels of fishing are consistent with sustainable management. I mean, there are some levels, I mean, zero fishing, yeah, sure, that is uh, consistent with sustainable management, but I mean, that's not, you know, very effective advice. Uh, so, so we try to do better than that. Uh, so, and I thought any, uh, to, to quickly go over the, uh, as an example, the recent terms of reference that uh, uh, for the three PS con stomach assessment that happened just last week. So there were uh, essentially four ter terms of reference. The first was, I mean, I'm on, and I'm just paraphrasing here, was consider ecosystem status and there's a lot of language there, but but basically the the terms of reference the the stock assessment was asked to consider 
<clears throat> oceanographic conditions, biological community structure and trends, and, and knowledge on uh, ecological interactions and, and anthrop anthropogenic impacts. And the assessment was also asked to document the probable causes for the, the stocks decline in any periods where this has been observed. So I will categorize these terms of references. Uh, they, they come into the FYI category. Uh, it's nice to know, but probably will not directly affect management decisions. I mean, they, they, they just, uh, met, you know, we can provide this information, but uh, like, how how are managers supposed to use this to uh, to affect their decisions? Uh, that's, that's that's a bit uncertain, unclear. But then there are of course the three other uh, terms of reference that are kind of more specific. Uh, uh, and so the meeting was asked to assess the current spawning stock biomass. <coughs> excuse me, relative to the limit reference point. So that's. That's a biomass level that's been established for the three PS cow stock that management is supposed to avoid with high probability. Uh, the meeting was to, uh, asked to assess the total biomass, exploitation rate, recruitment levels, fishing and natural mortality rates, and, and other biological characteristics. Now we're getting to the kind of the, the nuts of the assessment. They were asked to identify the level of removals that provide a positive trajectory of SSB over the short term and then three years with a 50% probability, 75 and 95% probability. So they were also asked to provide annual SSB projections to 2024, assuming total removals uh, were and these are multipliers, so we're zero, you know, fifty percent, one hundred percent, one hundred fifty percent, and one hundred and seventy-five percent of the of a total catch of thirteen thousand, uh, thirteen hundred forty-six tons, which was, I think, the estimate of the twenty twenty uh, land lease. So this is the sort of, and so they are asked to compute the probability in these projections. Uh, well, basically, at 2024, they were, so that's a three year projection. They were asked to compute the probability that SSB would exceed the limit reference point, and also that the projected SSB would exceed the current SSB, the 2021 level. So, these are the sort of, so basically, the assessment would produce risk tables about the impacts of uh, the various impacts of management options in the next three years. And this is the information that will uh, directly affect management decisions. So, so you really need to, for managers, uh, hone in on, okay, what, are, what will be the specific impacts of quota options you might consider in, in the next few years? And I would say that the, you know, these probability calculations, I mean, they're not like, trivial or for free or anything yet, you know, so it, we have to be careful how we do, do, do all of this and ad hoc or naive methodology will produce ad hoc or naive results. So some people don't want to, you know, just kind of don't want to spend the time to think, or, you know, not they don't want to may not add the time or, or skill set to, to, uh, you know, use good methodology for doing these calculations and, and, you know, then, uh, you know, you get, you get out what you put into it. So, uh, anyway, so on to, uh, uh, integrated, uh, what's an integrated safe space, uh, assessment. So when we say integrated in this sense, it just means use as much data as possible and the, and the advantage is that by integrating information, we can sometimes deal with problems that are impossible to address using data sources individually. And in the modeling sense, the, the way we combine information is by adding log likelihood functions. And the state-based framework is a, a, a good approach for this. So, like these probability statements uh, I mentioned there, uh, 
uh, you, you know, we should strive to, to, to make sure they're as accurate as possible. And one key part of that is that the probability should be based on all relevant data. So an assessment that just uses part of the relevant data has no hope of producing like uh, as accurate probabilities as possible. I mean, it's just as simple as thinking, okay, if you collected a hundred hundred measurements of something and maybe you were asked to get a confidence interval for the mean. And so if you just use 20 of your observations for the confidence interval, uh, I mean, it's just, how, there's no way you can argue that that is the best approach possible when you have a hundred observations available. Like, I think in that sense, everyone would agree you should use the hundred observations. And really, it's the same for stock assessment. We should use as much of the uh, relevant productivity information available as possible to get the best possible assessment. And I just give there's a, a like a little reference here in Fisheries Research on uh, 2013 is getting a bit old now, but it was a review of integrated analysis in, in fish stock assessment. So I, I mentioned likelihood. So I thought because this is a graduate, uh, you know, a graduate student talk that I would uh, at least describe what the likelihoods are. I'm not sure if everyone actually, you know, fully appreciates what what they are. So I, you know, likelihood. If we have some data X that we think come from a random variable big X, and the random variable big X has a probability distribution that involves what should I say like F sub F subscript X that involves an unknown uh, unknown parameter. So so basically the probability distribution you can evaluate like probabilities that X falls in some interval like. Uh, uh, if you know the parameters. So the likelihood function is based on the, this probability distribution, but the likelihood fun, uh, the likelihood of theta, it's a function of theta, but condition on the observed values of X. So, so you actually evaluate the density at the observed values of X. So, so that's the likelihood function. And if two, and you know, like if you have uh, two random variables that are independent, then their joint density is just a product of their their individual densities. So if two independent data sources x and y are available, then the likelihood of the, of the parameter vector theta theta given values of x and y is just a product of their densities, and the log likelihood then is just this this the some of the log likelihood of theta given x and theta given y. So, so this is then I'm just thinking if x and y are two independent data sources uh, that we might want to use in stock assessment, the way we integrate information is just to add log likelihoods. So this integration is conceptually simple. Now, uh, Another thing, another uh, kind of modeling approach that's getting uh, uh, a popular in stock assessment is uh, statistical states based models. So, and, and it's not just stock assessment, right? Pedersen and Ball felt that uh, they had become the favorite approach in modeling time bearing ecological phenomena. So, a states based model uh, typically includes like some type of population dynamics or population process model. Uh, that is uh, involves the the population or attributes of the population that are essentially latent or hidden from from direct observation, and uh, the the population dynamics model would typically be formulated to include a process error, so so that the model is only providing a, a an approximation of the time bearing ecological phenomena. Then we have data and associated observ uh, an associated observation model, uh, which is uh, basically uh, includes, well, the observation model is, is formally a likelihood function uh, and that represents the sampling process. So, so that's the states part, state part of the states-based model. And then maximum likelihood invasion methods have become the standard model fitting. I would say kind of 
more recently it's just maximum likelihood uh, uh, and Bayesian. So, so, so a little bit like state space, a quick slide on uh, another aspect of another complication that uh, in fitting uh, state space models. So these models are really mixed effects models. So that includes fixed parameters data and random effects, which we which I denote as like this big psi. And the random effects could be, for example, process errors or or whatever. And typically we want to estimate data based on marginal um, maximizing the marginal likelihood. And that marginal likelihood is uh, involves essentially getting the joint distribution of the data and the random effects, which is also the same thing as the conditional distribution of the data, which is I uh, let S denote the data just like generically. Could be like could be many things going into S. Uh, but if we look at the Conditional distribution of the data given the random effects and, and, and the parameter theta times the marginal distribution of the random effects. So the product of that gives you the joint distribution of the, ran, of the data and random effects. And then we need to integrate out the random effects to get the marginal likelihood that we want to use for estimating data. And like, so there's lots of, you know, evidence that this is a really good way to estimate the fixed effect parameter theta. But this is another integration, a different type of integration than just adding data, and it's the difficult one. So the marginal likelihoods just generally don't have closed forms. And and that has been a big impediment uh, traditionally or historically uh, to implementing you know state space models and nonlinear mixed effects models in general. But fortunately, uh, there has been some software that has come along in the last like five, uh, seven years or so that have really kind of uh, uh, made fitting these types of models much easier. So, so the template model builder package within R is good for this uh, situation. So, so TMB involves quick uh, implementation of complex, complex nonlinear random effect models. Uh, including state space models. And it's also good for like high dimensional or fairly high dimensional models. And the TMB was, well, it was formulated in a man manner similar to AD model builder, which is a package that, oh, well, it's still used a lot, uh, but it was at one point really the only the, the the best thing available to fit nonlinear mixed effects models, but so uh, people at the Danish Technical University in, in Denmark developed TNB as the kind of modern version of uh, uh, ADMB, and it's uh, computationally much more uh, efficient than ADMB. But uh, and you know there's some overhead to learning how to use TNB and. There has been also developed a package GLM and TMB uh, that is useful for fitting generalized linear mixed models. So this is a subset of the nonlinear uh, uh, mixed effects models, uh, but it's you know can be a lot easier to fit. But I would say more simple models uh, using GLM and. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend much on, time on this. The marginal likelihood is numer numerically evaluated via the Laplace approximation. All the user has to do is to provide C++ computer code to compute the, the distribution of the data conditional on the random effects and the distribution of the random effects. Uh, so TMB does the, the evaluates the marginal log likelihood for you, which is a great thing. And it also, uh, uh, provides the what's called the gradient or the derivative of the marginal log likelihood with respect to the with respect with respect to the fixed effects parameter theta. And these are returned as R objects. And for high kind of with the, the dimension of theta is high, it's really good to have this uh, derivative, this gradient vector. Uh, it, it's a great help in finding the maximum the marginal maximum likelihood value for theta. 
And I typically use the NLM in D every routine in R. TMB will also predict the uh, the uh, random effects uh, based on the estimates of beta, but I'm not, not going to get into that. And, and I just have a simple toy example, which we're not going to go through in detail, uh, but I just want to show that the, this doesn't have to involve a lot of code. So on the R side, like this code here, well, like the red code is just uh, a little bit of R code to simulate a random walk. So this is a, a toy example of a random walk. So this is just an R. And then the blue code here is uh, uh, the, uh, so this is the process model. The blue code is the observation model. So the, the data we have, Y, is just equal to the random walk plus some measurement error. So then we have a bit of code here to start packaging up the data for TMB, pretty simple. And like most of the, uh, you know, uh, so TMB requires also uh, information on what are the parameters and random effects, and you need to give them starting values. Uh, so here's the TMB code it's for a random walk. It's not extensive. I'm not going to go through the details, but but the the you know this is the a little bit of code to determine the this is basically the distribution of the random effects in this example the u random walks and this is the distribution of the data conditional on the random effects and then you, so in R you need to run a few steps to compile the so TMB this this is based on kind of C plus plus programming language. Uh, so then you need to compile that C++ code and, and do a few steps, but not very much anyway. And then you can, and all of this now is in R. Uh, then you can run your uh, NLM MIMB optimizer to find the maximum likelihood values of the parameter effects. Then there's this SD report procedure that will, you know, you can use to predict the values of the, the random, random effects, which is the random walk in this case, and, and get that uh, kind of like standard errors for those predictions as well. So then uh, I had some plotting code, which I'm not showing, but so this is just one of the uh, simulated data sets. So, so the gray line is the original random walk, like that U values I generated in R. Then the X's are the observations, the Y's coming here. So I'm just plotting the, the inputs. And the red line then is the, the, the predictions of the random walk that TNB produces as, and then the, the, that's the heavy red lines. The thin red lines are just indicating 95% confidence intervals for the predicted uh, random walk uh, uh, variables. And like the neat thing is, I think that the, well, the one good thing is that the prediction intervals, you, so the, the analysis only saw the X's, right? It didn't, didn't know anything about the, the solid gray lines to uh, use, but the confidence intervals or the prediction intervals for the random, uh, uh, the, the random walk effects usually cover what were the true values. Uh, there's just a couple of cases. I saw an exceedance here, a little one there, one there. And like there's an exceedance here, like here, here's a case where the, value of views outside the confidence interval. It's not, there's one over there too, but, but, but hey, look, a confidence interval is only supposed to cover the true values 95% of the time. And I think it, you know, it's clear that that's approximately the case here. So like my uh, Nan Zhang and I have uh, recently published a paper that uh, provides kind of some more information about what are the properties of the, the the standard errors for random effects that TMB produces. So, details. Okay, uh, let's get through an example. Uh, uh, Northern Con. So this was a toy example. Uh, this is a real example. And uh, yeah, I've been involved in the assessment of Northern Con since like the mid 1990s. Uh, and uh, in in 2013, or really in the early, you know, between 2010 and, well, for a number of years, actually, uh, late 2000s, or between 2000, 2000 between like 2005 and say 2015, the assessment was in uh, pretty bad shape. 
It was just based on trends and survey indices and estimates of harvest rates that were produced from uh, tagging data. They didn't really have, they didn't have a stock assessment model. And the reasons were several. Uh, people were, well, were pretty certain that the reported landings that were being provided by DFO were incomplete. Uh, we were concerned that the, something called the natural mortality rate M, which was usually assumed to be constant and, and small relative to fishing mortality. This was a typical assumption of stock assessments. But for Northern Cobb, we felt it was actually getting to be the reverse, that the natural mortality was some kind of a large relative to fishing mortality, and it was variable. And we also knew that there was problems in terms of the distribution of the stock relative to the surveys that were being used to, to monitor the stock. Like there was a period of time where a substantial fraction of the adult part of the stock was overwintering in the inshore uh, and not available to the, the fall uh, bottom trial survey, which, which was a problem. So the 2013 assessment did not provide catch advice. When this was a big problem for managers, right? Remember like uh, uh, that the managers are, are really uh, wanting information on the short and long-term stock risks of proposed management options. So a, well, I guess I started it, but other people have extended it, a, a, a state-based integrated model for uh, Norman Cod that, that addressed the catch and M and Q problems. And people call this NCAM, the Northern Cod Assessment Model. So the, the, the original publication is there in 2016, CJ Fast, but the model has been modified and extended since then. But it's not too different than, than, than uh, the 2016 paper. So the data used in NCAM, and this is a 2018 slide, I don't know. Couldn't really update this. I don't run in CAM anymore. I haven't run it since about 2016. This was a, a good situation where DFO took over in CAM and uh, really have been running it quite effectively without my help since then. And, and that is like that's that that is the that's a really the goal I think that the IRC wants to get to the develop models that other people take over and extend if they want. And to run without our help, if we can't, we just don't have time to be, uh, uh, or I don't have time anyway to be uh, running models for other people. So the data used in 2018, so it had the information on the fishery catches and this Tom's landed for, from, uh, but on, only from 83 to 2018, or really, we could just say this is the endpoint is just current, like this is updated every time they run the assessment, but. But it's starting in 83. They use information on the uh, age compositions of the catches. Ages, the age classes used in NCAM are 2 to 14, and again from 83. Bottom trial survey indices from 83 to, to, to you know, current. And as of 2018, like there's a lot of information, uh, <laughs> a lot of effort goes into those bottom trial surveys. So. So, for 83 to 2018, it involves 13,000 toes of the net, 277,000 length measurements, 58,000 uh, fish were measured for age. So, there's you know, a huge amount of effort going into it. They also use the uh, inshore sentinel gillnet survey indices, which don't have any further. Some inshore acoustic survey biomass estimates and age composition data that were available from 95 to 2009 that, and that were, you know, uh, an important indication of uh, that uh, there was a lot of cod in the inshore. Uh, and we think not available to the off, offshore uh, file survey. And there's a lot of tagging data used in NCAM. So in 2018, basically NCAM was being estimated with 231,000 uh, uh, tag fish released and 32,000 recaptured. And this was distributed over 408 experiments during 83 to 2018. And, and, and look, there's a lot involved in 
there's a lot of, you know, there are issues uh, that need to be addressed uh, when you're uh, looking at tagging data. So there's adjustments within NCAM for tagging mortality, tag loss, reporting rates. And then there's other biological inputs like the weights and maturities of fish and, and so on. And there's still more data out there. So, so NCAM is integrating a lot of information at, at, about the productivity of North, Northern Cod. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And I have just some slides that kind of, you know, illustrate maybe some, maybe most of you that uh, are familiar with the offshore uh, bottom trial surveys, but, you know, so they use, uh, uh, they're done annually via stratified random sampling design. So, I mean, there, there's spatial catches and that are aggregated somehow to produce what's called biomass indices and they produce abundance indices that numbers for uh, stock numbers as well. And there's a lot of biological information collected, like uh, here I'm just showing a kind of a, a figure for how the length compositions, uh, I don't think this is Northern Cod, this must be some other stock, uh, but you know, this is the type of information that would be uh, uh, collected uh, 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 for cod and for many other species in, in the bottom trial surveys. And fish are measured for length, age, weight, maturity, condition, liver, liver weight, and so on. So, kind of what was interesting to me is that we never used to pay much attention to uh, the condition information and stock assessment. Then we would look at it. And, but uh, Paul Rector has been, uh, at DFO, has been uh, kind of leading this kind of way of uh, 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 indexing a component of M, so M is natural mortality, that includes like predation mortality and and other sources of mortality. And I guess the thinking is starvation mortality at at, at various times and perhaps at various places uh, plays a large role in the uh, population dynamics of Northern God. So Paul has, uh, we had this, Paper just accepted last week, I think, or the week before, and uh, how we can kind of get some some sense about how M may be changing over time based on condition information. So this is a little like a comparison figure here with the the M's, the the orange lines and confidence intervals are M's average for various ages from NCAM. And then the blue lines are, are, are indices of M that uh, Paul, essentially Paul computes based on condition information. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's some people out there don't believe the NCAM M's for, for whatever reason. And, uh, but, you know, the variation in the NCAM M's it matches up pretty well with the, the variation in the condition uh, indices of M, but, you know, the peaks and valleys might not be the same, but anyway, I think it's providing some evidence that the NCAM M's are, are uh, uh, you know, uh, pretty realistic overall. But anyway, that's a, a side issue. So there's this acoustic surveys used in, in uh, NCAM. There's, you know, I mentioned these inshore uh, Acoustic surveys that occurred just in this small area called Smith Sound in Trinity Bay. That's it up there. Uh, but there's a little bit like there's offshore acoustic surveys that are out there too that could be used in NCAM. And in fact, they were used uh, in, in one assessment. Uh, uh, they didn't really make, affect the model fitting at all. So that's why they're not used now, but they could be used. Uh, and a lot of like, so this is the conventional spaghetti T bar tagging that NCAM uses like 32,000. Well, I don't know what it is now, but over 32,000 tag returns from. So, so, so that's the sort of thing that, you know, people, the primarily DFO, but the industry gets involved in the tagging as well. You just put this little external tag on. And then if it's caught in the fishery, fishermen are encouraged to return the tag include. And include information on like where and when it was caught, and, and if you know what the length of the fish uh, capture uh, was, uh, and so on. So there's a, a lot of this information in NCAM. 
Now, in the future, there, there, the DFO uh, and industry are, and the fishing industry are, are uh, implementing a offshore a telemetry tagging program. So, where they put acoustic uh, receivers out and then they apply acoustic tags to cod and, you know, so they get detected by the receivers. So, I think there's going to be a lot of new information uh, coming on stream in, in the future that. That NCAN uh, can and I guess will or future versions of NCAN can, can and, and will use. There's also a little bit of pop up satellite tagging, but I, I don't know, you know, it's really sparse and, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure there's much value in using that within NCAN. So, under the NCAM hood, uh, like I mentioned, these likelihoods, I better hurry up. Uh, so, there's a variety of likelihoods used for these various data sources, and there's reasons for all of this. Uh, there's, you know, I have spent years studying, you know, some of this type of data, and not really the acoustic stuff much, but, but everything else. And uh, so, there are reasons for all of uh, this that I don't have time to get into. Uh, but the catch is, uh, we use this thing called a, a censored likelihood for catches. So I thought to just talk a bit about that. Uh, so the problem uh, for Northern Cod is that the reported landings now are only from the commercial fishery. DFO hasn't been trying to estimate recreational landing for a while. And even in years when they did, there was a lot of disagreement about how accurate were, were the estimates. So. So, basically, the reported catches are really only partial. What do you do with that? So, the way it's used within NCAM, the NCAM actually doesn't use the specific values of the reported catches. They are treated as a lower bound for what the, the commercial plus recreational catches are, and the user has to set a lower bound. And like here's a kind of an explanation of uh, this is from the, the last NCAM run that was available to me. So, uh, what we have here is the NCAM predicted catch divided by the observed catch. So, the NCAM, so NCAM is actually, uh, you know, estimating what the catches are, and but that has to lie within these bounds. And so, NCAM is like, and the users supply these bounds. So, the lower bound is actually, uh, 10% greater than the reported catch in the upper bound. There's various, you know, multipliers of reported catch that, that were decided at a stock assessment meeting to be realistic. So, like, historically, prior to essentially uh, the collapse of the stock in 93, people felt like the, the upper bound on catch would, would have been 50%, uh, uh, like, 50% greater than reported catch. That, that there was very little chance that the fishery was catching more than, you know, 1.5 times reported and so on. Uh, but these bounds aren't hard bounds. NCAM can go outside the bounds, but it doesn't like to. And so this is predicted over observed, and this is just like predicted and observed. And I had a slide, and uh, I'm running out of time, so I had a slide on how censored likelihoods work, but, uh, you know, I'll have to skip them, I think. Uh, 44, yeah. But essentially, uh, so NCAM gets bounds. Uh, they're not hard bounds. You can make them soft. Uh, there's a parameter you can set that makes the bounds either kind of like hard bounds or soft bounds. Uh, depending on how big you make this parameter. But the, so I don't know exactly what they've been doing with the NCAM lately. It looks like you can go outside of the bounds a fair bit. Uh, so my guess is they had that thing set to be like up around 0.05 or something. So another uh, important input into NCAM is information on the catch age composition. And that that's a tough one. The statistical properties of the catch age sampling are very complex. And essentially, these days, the sample sizes are, are, are practically not available, certainly for the digital work sampling. Uh, we, we just, it's maybe not even reported, but uh, 
So we just get the proportions. We don't know like how many fish were uh, uh, measured for age and length and that from the catch. And the, it's a very complicated sampling design in any event. It's length, area, quarter, uh, like quarter of the year, stratified cluster sampling. And there's a lot of missing strata and there's data warming to fill in missing strata. So, so, I mean, in the end, what does sample size mean anyway? So NCAM uses an approach for compositional data and, and there's a lot of thinking down into that, but, but I, I wish we did, we knew the sample sizes. So NCAM future, uh, like already in, in the works is something DFO calls extend cam. So they've extended it back in time to include landings in, uh, information uh, back in, not in 1959, but some concerns about how to do that, like in terms of how do, you, how do you model the process errors prior to the start of surveys? So, and they, there's more data out there. There's the spring 3L survey indices they'd like to include, the Newman Sound Recruitment Index, and I've already mentioned all this tel telemetry data. They want to add ecological effects, uh, which ones. Uh, this, this is basically the three bullets from Paul, Paul Regler, and this would be kind of in addition. Uh, uh, kind of my wish list is that uh, to improve the survey index NLLs. Uh, I wish we had information on what the sample sizes were for, for, the, for the age sampling of the catch. And and, I, and someone needs to sort out, there's a lack of fit within NCAM now between the offshore body call survey indices and the fishery and sentinel age comps. And I, I wish that could get sorted out. Same problem exists in 3TS Canada on the south coast. So integrate assessments wrap up. So diverse data related to stock productivity may be available. Each data source comes with its own sampling properties and the issues involved in the data, the various data sources need to be acknowledged in the model. It's important to get the likelihoods right. Ad hoc likelihoods will lead to ad hoc data weighting, and which is the same as poor data weighting. And so, if you want to do a good stock assessment, you need to thoroughly understand each data source that you're using in order to get something sensible. And this is tough for new people. It, I must admit, it's like it's you know, it's it's it just takes a lot of work to uh, get involved and learn about all the issues of the various data sources people are using for stock assessment. So, but even if you, you do all of this work, there will still be some subjectivity in the choice of likelihoods. Uh, and so by the robustness of, uh, so whenever there's a subjective choice in stock assessment, people should be concerned about the subjectivity to that choice. Like, so if, if there's a subjective choice of reasonable alternatives produce the same results, well, that's good. But if there's a subjective choice and reasonable alternatives produce quite different results, that's not good. You got a problem there. And I mentioned spatial. So, so, so with, you know, we've done all this stuff with integrated assessment models, but like, you know, still they're not good enough because there are important spatial dimensions to stock productivity and life history processes that what I call like space aggregated assessment models, like total stock assessment models that uh, just have no, can't adequate, adequately account for. Also, uh, incre you know, so increasingly fisheries managers and in industry are asking for spatial advice, which of course you can really provide directly with using a space aggregated assessment model. Like, so they might want to know, you know, a lot of information on impacts of seasonal spawning closures, uh, and it's fairly rude common now for managers to be looking for uh, aerial quota advice. So they want quotas for different stock, the different subregions of the stock. <coughs> and there are often uh, important spatial dim dimensions to stock assessment data that are better accommodated in a, sp in a spatial model. So like for NCAM, we have the inshore sentinel surveys and offshore bottom call surveys. So if the stock, if the distribution of the stock you know, inshore and offshore is changing over time. It's kind of hard to account for that. Uh, a lot, you know, NCAM is trying to do to do something there. 
Hence, uh, state of the art integrative assessments will need to be spatial in in the future, but I don't think this is the, the, the not, it, I'd call this the not so near future or the near distant future. I mean, probably not, you know, probably not for me. I'll be retired before these things get routine, but uh, maybe some of you uh, will, will see it. Uh, but you know, what do we mean by spatial anyway? They could be as simple as uh, including broad scale spatial dimensions and survey catchability. That's what NCAN has done. They could be less simple meta substock models, and 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 but they may be more complex spatially gridded approaches with movements and and all that stuff. Uh, so a little bit on the what the IRC contributions to spatial spatial assessment uh, have been. So we really, this is, the one in gray here wasn't really an IRC contribution, but as far as I know, we have basically four publications, uh, but the, the only one by Rajiv Kumar et al, 2020, that is the most, con, the closest to uh, achieving a spatial stock assessment model. Like, that is something called a spatial survey-based assessment model. You know, but I think it, you know, Rajiv got to the point where it was pretty uh, straightforward to turn that uh, uh, turn this into a uh, like a full state based spatial integrated assessment model. And but we haven't really been made progress on this since uh, Rajiv was a postdoc here, perhaps before most of you guys uh, came, but. The, he left a couple of years ago, and we really haven't been able to find someone to continue that that work. So, so like a major problem uh, in stock assessment research is just a lack of bodies to do the work. So, so that has languished uh, uh, because no one is spending time on it. We have a lot of uh, papers in prep that are kind of supporting spatial stock assessment model. And I like this one that, that Nan Zhang uh, is leading uh, is integrated spatial temporal models for growth and maturity. And I like it because it's kind of getting at what could be more sensible spatial divisions for a stock assessment model. So what Rajiv, uh, yeah, what Rajiv looked at, he just did a financial strata, which may be kind of arbitrary in terms of stock productivity dynamics. So. So I like that. And uh, I guess uh, uh, Jin has a student working on a spatial temporal surplus production model for redfish, uh, uh, you know, which is great, but it, it, it's not using compositional information. So, uh, so I don't think, uh, we, you know, you could ever characterize that as the best possible approach for stock assessment, but it's, it's, it's a good, a good thing to, uh, to support uh, uh, spatial stock assessment. And we have some more of them. So also my last slide, I guess, uh, uh, you know, the future, I think it's not just spatial models. Uh, there could be what I call meta stock models. So Andrew Punk calls it the Robin Hood approach. So I think there will be uh, uh, some benefit to modeling as several stocks uh, of the same or sim similar species simultaneously with shared with some shared uh, parameters for different stocks. Uh, I think there will be mixed fisheries models where uh, the fishery is catching multiple stocks simultaneously and may and in some cases not, you know, like for redfish, multiple stocks are, are caught simultaneously and we can't tell the, the species apparent. Uh, you know, more dynamic single species assessment models, including ecosystem drivers. That's the sort of thing one of Paul Regler mentioned he'd like to take in can. And then there are various types of ecosystem models that uh, everyone, uh, or not everyone, but many people think need to be used more in, in fish stock assessment. But they, they, they still, like at present anyway, tend to be big black boxes that, you know, Models that people don't understand very well and produce output that people don't understand very well. So, so that's it anyway. I'm sorry I took a bit longer than the, the normal time, but thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cadigan.
All right, um, I think we have time for a couple questions. If anybody online or in person wants to ask a question, um, I would ask you if you're in person to over at the podium ask um, so that he could actually hear you because it might be impossible from where you're sitting. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so go ahead and raise your hand online if you want to ask. And I think it's muted, so if you um, unmute it when you start and then mute it when you're done. Thank you. Yeah, John here. Thanks for your presentation, Noel. Um, in, uh, at the start, you talked about Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and you talked about the Starship Enterprise. And on your last slide here, you have a number of different, uh, uh, different characterizations, a number of different ways that uh, things could go. You talked about uh, NCAN, you talked about the old Cerbera. Um, just wonder what in your mind what would be uh, Starship Enterprise versus Chitty Chitty Bang Bang within this sort of realm, and uh, I guess and more specifically, what do you see for Starship Enterprise in the future? So, like the Starship Enterprise is out there, where uh, like more along the lines of things that the uh, what was that big one? Uh, big eco. I'm thinking they're more like ecosystem models like that you know people live on them and you know they're self can you know they, they, it's self-containing you know, medical services uh, uh and every, everything is there i work on board a chitty chitty bang bang type models like basically the, the the minimal type of minimal models uh in, in a way uh well not really minimal this might not be a fair characterization but uh but the models that are are, are designed to just get the job done, and like Atlantis uh, uh, is what I would call like an, you know a Starship Enterprise type ecosystem model. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so that's kind of what we're my thinking uh, is, in, and and of course those characterizations are you know shades of gray, but. Okay, maybe a, a quick follow up then. So, if uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is a way that you've been thinking, um, and NCAN is an iteration of sort of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and you could imagine uh, integrated models could integrate infinitely into the future, um, at what point do you, do you, would someone say stop integrating new information into something like NCAN? Are there ways to look back at how NCAN has been performing, or when things are integrated, is it just too much in too much information to actually diagnose which uh, levers are um, pushing things in different directions. Yeah, and that is uh, yeah. So typically, you know, well, you could. S that's a good. That's a good. Good question. So usually we look at the how, you know, how do you kind of measure the performance of a stock assessment model or the accuracy of it. So people use simulation testing, uh, and that's a problem for models like uh, like in NCAM that are you, you have a lot of data to simulate. So how should you simulate all that data? Uh, so I did a little bit of simulation testing with NCAM. I think more should be done, but that would be primarily the way you measure how well it's working. People do this thing, you know, it's kind of retrospective model fitting too, as a, but that doesn't really, I think, directly address what 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 you're thinking about, like, uh, uh, so how well is NCAM working? In? And and then I, I guess your question was, what is you know what is the value of adding new data uh, to NCAM? Uh, so I think that also needs to be carefully considered. Like, what is it that NCAM can't do now that new data will will enable it? Uh, and, and I think that needs to be thought through. Yeah. Thanks, John. Like when I was first developing NCAM, just just to, just to say a bit more, uh, we uh, kind of we knew I knew that ends weren't constant, and I was. Trying to estimate the ends based just on survey indices. I wasn't using the tagging data and it wasn't being, you know, it wasn't successful. So, so that's why I added the included, uh, 
tagging data in the in the fitting of NCAM, and that that uh, uh, that uh, basically enabled the ends to be estimated. Uh, uh, and we could, I guess, you know, you can always, you should, uh, you should be uh, always be critical about how accurate our, our estimates that any model produces. I suppose. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I think that's all we have uh, it for time for today. I'll just take a second to introduce next week's uh, seminar here. We're going to have a uh, DFO research scientist, Dr. Harry Murray. He's going to be here talking about parasitic copepods. Uh, it's titled who we are and, and uh, what do we do? Um, but yeah, so thank you for coming in Dr. Uh, Cadigan and we really appreciate the talk. Okay. Bye.